And so with Spengler, uh, Volume 2, Chapter 4, Cities and Peoples, Part A, The Soul of the City, we come to one of my favorite chapters in Spengler, uh, in which he talks about, in much more detail, this process of the evolution of the city, uh, from the village to the town to the capital city to finally the megalopolis, and its final process of extermination from within and, and its gradual uh, reverting to nature with depopulation and extremely primitive peoples moving into highly civilized uh, architectural modes of living. So that he goes through the whole morphology and miniature now of the rise and fall of a civilization, but looked at from the standpoint of what happens to the individual cities in the process. Um, so he begins the chapter with a discussion of the difference between the Mycenaeans and the Minoans. And he says that if we look at the relationship that the Mycenaeans had between uh, the civilization of Minoan Crete, uh, as everyone knows, uh, the style forms of Minoan Crete are very influential on the Mycenaeans. This is approximately 1700 to 1500 BC, right in there. Um, what we have with the Mycenaeans, actually, Spangler says, is a springtime people, or rather a pre-cultural pre uh, example, a pre-cultural phase before the crystallization with the Homeric uh, civilization of the classical world. What we have is extremely primitive fortress strongholds at Pylos and at the various uh, strongholds in Tiryns and Mycenae extremely primitive sort of strongholds that are equivalent to the Germanic barbarian uh, fortresses and strongholds in Western Europe in a later phase of history. Whereas with uh, Minoan Crete, we have an example of a late megalopolitan, cosmopolitan civilization of luxury and opulence, a decadent civilization that he situates uh, as basically an offshoot of, uh, of the late megalopolitan phase of Egypt. Egypt at this time was being invaded by the Hyksos, uh, and which signals the, its period of the shift from culture to civilization, which is equivalent to the Napoleon-Alexander phases in those respective civilizations. And so he thinks that maybe a number of artists fled <coughs> in all this social chaos, fled maybe to Minoan Crete and put their intelligences to work, uh, designing a lot of the Minoan Cretan palaces, the famous palace at Canossus being uh, the charismatic exemplar of a very refined, very cosmopolitan, a very spoiled, rich, luxurious civilization um, with the bull cults being practiced there as a kind of exemplar of the late tension uh, sports and gladiatorial arenas of the later uh, phase of the Roman civilization. Um, <clears throat> the only problem is I, I think maybe um, he might be making a mistake in identifying Minoan Crete as an outshoot, uh, as an offshoot rather, an outpost of the Egyptian civilization, because I see Minoan Crete as a very different civilization with, with its own unique, uh, distinct identity. It very much belongs, uh, in my opinion, as a pre-culture example to the Greek civilization, even though I do agree with him that uh, Minoan Crete at this phase, 1700 to 1500, is a late megalopolitan uh, type of society of luxury and opulence. I do agree with that. The art forms there, uh, the frescoes in the palaces are very stiff. Uh, they have a kind of shopping mall, inauthentic quality to them. Uh, so I agree with that. <clears throat> but with Minoan Crete, we have the enunciation of the cult of the wonder child for the first time in history. Uh, we don't see any old people painted in the frescoes uh, at Minoan Crete at all. They're the first to separate the cult of the dead from the cult of the living by uh, no longer continuing the old Neolithic practice of burying the dead under the floors of their houses. They put the dead out in separate cemeteries. The Mycenaeans, by contrast, are still burying the dead. They still have a, a strong ancestor cult. They're still burying the dead within the strongholds, actually within the walls of the fortresses at Tiryns and Mycenae. Um, <clears throat> the dead are still being worshipped there in a very strong ancestor cult. But the Minoans are already separating the two realms, and there's lots of paintings, if not at Minoan Crete, and some of the, the outlying frescoes found on some of the other islands. Uh, where we find lots of images of young boys, um, young kings, um, no old men at all in this art. So it, it does seem to announce the new idea of the wonder child and the turn away from the dead and the old and the cult of the elders toward the cult of the new that has characterized Western civilization ever since. I see them then as, as, as belonging more so in the pre-culture phase of the Greeks than in the Egyptian late megalopolitan style formation. But be that as it may, Spengler's analogy then, he draws this analogy to, uh, he says, compare the situation of the Mycenaeans vis-a-vis -vis the Minoans, uh, where the Mycenaeans 
copied all the culture forms as at the palace at Pylos, which looks like a Mycenaean. Uh, it's deliberately modeled on a Mycenaean, uh, a Mycenaean uh, palace. Compare what's going on with Charlemagne. Uh, the period of Char Charlemagne is basically just a glorified tribal chieftain. It's a very primitive phase of culture that he belongs to. It corresponds to the Mycenaean fortress strongholds, and his uh, the creation of his um, palace at Aachen. Uh, the church there is no longer a mosque, but not yet a cathedral. It's in a transitional phase, and the influences there are coming from the south, from Spanish Moorish architecture, especially in the the example of the mosque at Cordova, where we see the candy-striped colors of the arches that uh, Charlemagne copies for the palace at Aachen. We can see the influences there. It's a very similar situation of a late megalopolitan civilization uh, that Islam is in at this time, 800 uh, BC, or rather 800 AD that, that uh, Islam is in at this time, late megalopolitan decadent op opulence, and these very primitive uh, newborn peoples of a pre-culture phase copying their style forms and importing them uh, in a very hesitant, uncertain way. I think the analogy there is very good uh, between uh, Pilos and Aachen on the one hand and um, Minos, uh, Canassos, and uh, Cordova on the other end. It's very good. Uh, Spengler has a very good idea, a very good, um, rather, a, a very good um, eye for, for, for identifying culture forms and what phase they belong to. So with that in mind, he says that what we have to consider now is the evolution of a city, what, what its character is when it first starts. He says that with primitive man, and presumably he means uh, uh, the primitive man of the Paleolithic, uh, is a ranging type of animal uh, that roves across the landscape and plunders it, um, and is always paranoid about nature, is trying to keep nature out of his uh, little roving nomadic culture, and uh, sees this nature as a sum total of goods there to be plundered and taken, as the hunters do. Whereas he says that <clears throat> once you shift into the agricultural period of the Neolithic, uh, with the beginnings of agriculture, nature is no longer to be plundered, it's to be altered now. It's actually to be reshaped and re-sculpted by the activities of the human being. And as a result, <clears throat> primitive man shifts into, from the mode of the animal to the mode of the plant, and with the first villages and farmhouses, uh, humanity begins to take on a plant-like existence rooted to the soil. Uh, it's a very, in terms of, uh, if we remember his terminology of Dasein versus Voxein, Dasein for whom is being the unconscious pulse beat and rhythm of the macrocosm, but it's still heavy upon these village cultures these farming villages that, that spring up, very they grow out of the land like plants. They're heavy with, with, with a dark, mystical, brooding, dreamlike, uh, cosmic plant existence, not yet the existence of the towns. And he says that <clears throat> this is all, the, the village basically, uh, the Dasein heavy village, village as being, belongs to the pre-culture phase of a civilization. But once towns begin to differentiate themselves from villages, we're moving into the springtime phase of the early culture period. And he says that the difference then <clears throat> between the town and the village um, is actually that sometimes it may not be so obvious to the eye because in many cases, uh, as far as the buildings go, they might look the same between village and town. But the difference is that the town possesses a soul now and begins to awaken. It begins to shift from a Dasein mode, a being mode, to a Voxein mode and begins to awaken. Waking being begins to open up and intellect begins to slowly wake up to the dawn of the civilization and begin to express itself through the various culture forms. The Gothic cathedrals are built, they grow up out of the landscape organically. Um, we begin to get uh, uh, the shift from a village barter economy, which had characterized the village economy of the pre-culture period, period, to uh, the market economy of the towns uh, we begin to get the, the shift to the moving of the economy into the center of the town square where the vendors line up all their goods and stalls. Uh, and now it's a market economy. And we begin to get a consciousness amongst the townsmen that he is something different from the peasant, something different from the countryside, something superior to the countryside. And we begin to get in the town the earliest disdain of the townsmen and, and the contempt that he has for the for the 
the blind, dumb man of the countryside, uh, the rube, as he is characterized by the townsman who is merely, uh, who merely propagates the generations blindly and dumbly, and for whom history does not exist. For Spangler, history begins at this point uh, with the towns. History is a function of the metabolism of towns as they evolve into big cities uh, and does not exist for the village culture uh, and the, the, the primitive man of the countryside who exists in an eternal, blind, dreamlike, cosmic heavy uh, existence. So with the towns we begin to get a shift into a microcosm of the macrocosm uh, in which we have a, a money economy beginning and in which we have the grand arts of form beginning to come in and a shift into Voxine and an awakening uh, to a new realm of style formation uh, that begins to change now. The rhythm of the society begins to change over time. And then gradually the town gives way to what he calls the capital city. The, uh, this is still in the Kultura period, but it's now uh, beginning to move into the late rather than the early Kultura period where we get the city now in full form. Uh, it's not yet the megalopolis, but it's the city in full form, places like Nuremberg and Bruges and Antwerp. Uh, this is the world that Bruegel paints in his paintings, where the countryside is still there and still visible, and the peasant is still uh, in the city, but the city is, is, is beginning to dominate, and the intellect is rising into its high period with Descartes and Leibniz and Spinoza, and the grand arts of form are climaxing and flourishing. Uh, as the city begins to take over and dominate, we move from the Gothic cathedrals to the great palaces of the Baroque. Uh, and now we're into the age of the capital city, the early version of Paris. Um, London is beginning to come in, and the other cities are beginning to become provincial. Uh, so this is the age of the great capital city, in which the disdain between the townsman and the peasant begins to become sharper and sharper. And slowly, waking being begins to perfuse every aspect of the culture, begins to stamp it and transform the old Dasein world into a world of, of pure, alert, waking being, waking intellect. Every aspect of the culture is perfused with intellect now. It's still linked with a metaphysical epoch. It's still in a metaphysical age. But this is the age of the rise of science and philosophy and the grand arts of form uh, that begin to climax and move into the... Uh, and move from the uh, the early town phase to the late town phase. Um, and he says uh, that then this begins to shift into the late city phase and the rise of the megalopolis and the shift from the culture period to the civilization period in which we begin to begin, uh, we get the megalopolis as a new form that comes into being. He says the first megalopolis in the classical civilization is Alexandria. The first megalopolis in the Mesopotamian civilization is Babylon, although I would argue that the first megalopolis there actually should be Akkad uh, that is founded and built by Sargon of Akkad. It's, it's the world's first planned city. And Spengler says that one of the unfailing characteristics of a megalopolis uh, during this phase is that it's, it's very often planned out. Not always, but very often it's planned out. And it will be one of the architectural characteristics of the planned megalopolitan city is invariably that it's laid out on a grid, which is always a sign, he says, of a soulless city. And uh, since all American cities, every single one of them is laid out on the grid idea, it might be that we can say that America never had a culture in somewhat the same way in which he says that England and British civilization never had a culture either and that it's been a civilization type of uh, society all along. He says the same thing, incidentally, about the Japanese vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese that the Japanese never had a culture either, and that their civilization has been of, of the civilization type like England uh, all along. That's a debatable point. But uh, So we can think of America as never having had a culture, and indeed I don't think it ever did have one. Although we could think of the Civil War, like the World Wars, as a kind of war between culture and civilization, between North and South, where the South is still clinging to an ancient agrarian culture world, uh, most of our best writers come out of the South. Uh, the, the great ideal of the Southern learned, the encyclopedically learned gentleman, the Thomas Jefferson, the Edgar Allan Poe, and then later all the great writers, you know, from Faulkner and Tennessee Williams to Flannery O'Connor uh, and Thomas Wolfe, all these great writers that come out of the South. The South is really the, the culture world of America. It's where the culture has come from. And the result of the Civil War was, of course, to shift... 
New York from the level of a provincial city to a cosmopolis, a world city, from that point on, as Spengler points out. So we can see the struggle, a similar struggle going on there as we saw in the World War. Uh, maybe not to quite the same degree, since America never was a big culture place to begin with, but such values of culture as it did have, I think, the last stand was, was for them during the Civil War. Uh, 